Hi there. Welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. I'm your host, Sarah Buino. I just want to say thanks. Thanks for listening. I really, totally sincerely appreciate that people keep coming back to listen. This has been such a really cool journey for me, and and so I just wanted to take a moment out and give you my gratitude. And you probably guessed it. Now here comes the marketing pitch. Uh, I recently started a Patreon account because, you know, I've been hearing the message more lately from people who are saying, know your worth. And so I'm going to start trying to live from that place of knowing my worth. And one of the ways that that can manifest is by asking for help a little bit more. And so podcasts are not cheap. I have an amazing, incredible editing team that takes care of all of the hard stuff for me that I would never have been able to figure out how to do, but it's not cheap. And so I could really use your support. So if you visit Patreon, we are at patreon.com slash wounded healer, and that's healer, H-E-A-L-R, because that was what was on Twitter, and I just want to keep them all the same. So kind of lame, but there you have it. Let me introduce you to today's guest. Her name is Jean Campbell. And she's got a long bio because she has an illustrious career. So Jean is a board-certified trainer, educator, and practitioner of psychodrama, sociometry, group psychotherapy, and she's a fellow of the American Society of Group Psychotherapy and Psychodrama, a practitioner and trainer of psychodramatic bodywork, a master's level certified experiential therapist, a TEDx presenter, a co-recipient of the Innovators Award from the ASGPP, a Reiki master, a graduate of the Whole Being Institute, certificate in positive psychology, a certified professional coach, a somatic experiencing practitioner in training, and Jean has extensive teaching experience, including as an adjunct professor at San Diego University for Integrative Studies in San Diego, an instructor at UCLA Extension in University of California, Los Angeles, as a faculty member at Roiken College in Los Angeles, and as a psychodramatic trainer at on-site workshops in Cumberland Furnace, Tennessee. Also a program facility member of the iCare Interpersonal Communication Relationship Enhancement Program at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Whew. If you're not impressed by that, I don't know what's going to impress you. I have a great, awesome conversation with Jean. I am so appreciative that Beck G. Cohen hooked us up. And I think that if you're into therapy and all of the things that surround it, you're going to really love this conversation with Jean. So please enjoy. Hello, Jean. Welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. How are you? I'm well. Thank you. How are you? It's been a day, you know. (laughs) (laughs) I do. (laughs) Yeah. I had the best dream last night. I can't remember what the substance was of the dream, but there were a bunch of docks and puppies. I have a dachshund. So yeah, so there were a bunch of docks and puppies. And then at one point I was outside and a mama deer and a baby deer came up to me and like nuzzled me. Nice. Yeah. And then I woke up to a really not so great email. So I'm going to take that dream as like, you're okay. Everything's going to be okay. <laughs> See, now, if this were a psychodrama workshop, I could take you right back into the dream. Oh, my God. Can we just? (laughs) Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. So before we do that and do my own psychodrama over Skype, you want to tell folks, (laughs) which would be hilarious. I'm sure someone has done it, right? But would you tell listeners who you are and what you do? So who am I? That's a very big question. I know. I know. But who I am professionally, I identify myself in quite a few roles. I am a licensed clinical social worker, so I do have a background as a therapist. I'm also a board certified psychodrama trainer and practitioner, which I know we're going to talk quite a bit about. I also do a modality called psychodramatic body work, which combines psychodrama with Chinese medicine. (gasps) I never knew there was such a thing. Oh, Oh, God, we have so much to talk about. Yes. My favorite title that I describe myself as is a spiritual midwife. Oh, Jean, I didn't know this. I'm really excited now. Yes. So I really feel like I have the honor and the privilege of midwifing people Mm -hmm. into their best possible selves, both Mm -hmm. professionally and personally. Oh, my God. Okay, what do I ask first? (laughs) So this is also a big question. It's funny, I interviewed my therapist and prior to that, I'd had women in probably the earlier part of their career. And when I asked her this question, like, how did you get here? She was like, Sarah, that's going to be a really long answer. (laughs) But I think whatever it is that you're called to share about your journey is what is supposed to show up today. So what do you want to share about how you got to this place? 
So I got into my own healing journey about 30 years ago. Mm. And as a result of that, what I came to realize is although I was working in corporate America and by every standard in our culture, I was quote unquote successful, yep. but I was not fulfilled and happy. Mm-hmm. I was making really good money. I was living in New York City. I was clawing my way up to the top. And yeah. I just, in one of my own psychodrama therapy sessions, said to my therapist, is this it? Like, I don't want to do this mm-hmm. for the rest of my life. And so we did a psychodrama exercise where I sat in a series of different chairs that represented different options. Oh, shit. Yeah. Brilliant. And, you know, one, <laughs> one of them was to stay in the same profession. Ironically, I have been working with drug addicts and alcoholics for decades. And at the time, I was working for a pharmaceutical marketing firm. Wow. But wow. one of the choices was to stay in that industry, but find a different job. Another mm-hmm. option was to, I don't even remember what they were, but last minute put out a chair and said, I could always go back to school. Mm. And when I, and I felt like that chair was a cop out because I'd been working at that point for 11 years. But when I sat in it, I mean, it sounds like a Goldilocks moment, but it was just right. Mm. And I remember my therapist, my wonderful therapist, this guy named Dick Graycheck in New York city said to me, well, (laughs) He said, people come to you for help and advice all the time. You might as well get paid for it. Mm -hmm. And so I went to graduate school at Fordham in New York, and I worked in treatment centers, a wonderful treatment center in New York City called InterCare. And then I ran their family program because I entered the world initially, the therapeutic world, from more of a family perspective because I'm an Mm -hmm. ACOA. I didn't have a problem with alcohol. My parents did. So Mm -hmm. it took me a while to realize that I needed to get sober. But so I ran that family program. Then I went into private practice for years. And what finally drew me to California, I moved out here about 14 years ago. Big piece of it, quite frankly, and you can identify with this probably because you live in the Midwest, is I got signal affective disorder. Mm. I thought everybody was depressed in February. And it turns (laughs) out that it Mm -hmm. was not everybody. Mm -hmm. It was me. Except everybody in Chicago, but. (laughs) Well, I mean, even with taking vitamin D and the light box, I just, I could not live in New York anymore. And, you know, it was, I guess, four years, no, three years after 9-11. And I'd had enough of the city vibrating every time they raised that BS terror alert. Right. So were you in New York during 9-11 then? I was, yeah. Oh, Wow talk about like inherited trauma. Mm. Yeah. I'm still discharging that on. I bet. Yeah. There are times still discharging that. Anyway. So when I looked around the country, I knew that I was wanting to teach because I really love doing it and I've been told I'm good at it. And so when I looked around the country at where I was willing to live, that would be conducive to my own personal health in terms of enough sunlight, et cetera. And where there were not a lot of other psychodrama trainers, I Mm. ended up in Los Angeles. So I started a training institute here in 2005 and little by little have grown it. And now I mostly run training groups for professionals, therapists, counselors, coaches, lawyers, nurses, doctors, et cetera, so that they not only can get trained in how to use experiential and psychodrama methods, Mm -hmm. but they they have a safe place to do their own work. Yeah. Because the more status you get in this business, the harder and harder it is to find those places. Yes. Yes. And so <laughs> I'm, I'm, fine. I'm in that spot now. Yes, I know. Yeah. yeah. And then a couple of years ago, about a year and a half ago, I guess, along with collaborating with a couple of colleagues, I started also offering co-facilitating men's leadership workshops and mm. women's leadership workshops. And that has been a really empowering it's just been so delicious to help these mostly young, I don't want to say kids, because I sound so old when I say that, but <laughs> right, yeah. you know, these, it just ages yourself. In their early thirties, you know, mm-hmm. and the people listening to this don't know. I mean, I'm in my late fifties mm-hmm. and these kids who are getting no mentorship, mm-hmm. who are out there on their own feeling lost. And I know what it's like to feel alone. When I was in private practice, it's a very lonely place to be. Yes. And so I really am loving providing safe places for them, but also helping them learn what it's like to step into the role of a leader. So I'm sharing my experience, strength, and hope in that because I've been Mm -hmm. in leadership roles on more than one occasion. Mm -hmm. And there's a real skill set that goes along with that. Yeah. I'm... (laughs) 
I'm having a lot of growing pains about being a manager and recognizing how unprepared I am for that role, but it's too late. I have a staff, so. (laughs) Right. Well, most people who end up in a leadership role are unprepared. Right. Well, in our industry, it's different in the business world to a certain extent, Mm -hmm, but in our industry, there's not a lot of mentoring going on. Yeah. Luckily, I have found some really great people. Like, I don't know if LA is the same, but Chicago's addiction community is really tight and really small. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, everybody, right? And and I've got some great people who've mentored me here. So luckily, I do have people I can go to and be like, help. (laughs) Yeah, good for you. Yeah. And I sought it out and created actually a group of other female practice owners so that we could all kind of share in that struggle together. And that has been the best thing that I think I've ever done for myself is just like circling women together. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because the other piece of it is that the more status you get in this industry, the harder it is to say, hi, I don't really know what I'm doing in this new Mm -hmm. role. Can somebody help me? please? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, It's a lot of trial by fire. Right. Let's talk about psychodrama for a bit. I guess for people who may not know what that is, because I think we have plenty of people, therapists and not therapists who listen to this podcast. So could you explain in general what psychodrama is and then we can dig into like how it works and anything, all of it? Sure. All of it. (laughs) So it's interesting because yesterday was the 98th anniversary of the first official psychodrama that was done publicly by the creator of the method, Jacob Moreno. Wow. And a lot of people think it's kind of a relatively newfangled modality, but Mm -mm. it's been around for a very, very long time. Right. I mean, I love the fact that he did it on April 1st. Mm -hmm. And it was actually, I think it was probably planned because it's a long story, but he was in Vienna, Austria. It's post-World War I. Mm. The country is not doing well and they're trying to sort out what's next. And he invited, I think over a thousand people showed up to it and he did it in a theater and he basically put an empty chair out on the stage that represented the throne Hmm. and then a crown and a jester's hat and invited people to come up and take on the role of the king or the jester, Hmm. who the fool is typically the most wise person Mm -hmm. on the floor. But people were outraged and wanted no part of it. So one of the things he learned that night was about the importance of warm up. And (laughs) can't just bring that on people without warming Mm -hmm. them up. So Mm -hmm. it is, for those who don't know, it's an action-based method. And it's a way that we can explore both our internal and external worlds and move towards change where we need to make change. So Mm -hmm. instead of talking about issues... We can explore old patterns. We can explore any thoughts, feelings, behaviors that don't work for us. We can try on new behaviors and explore any of the situations, people, relationships in our lives by taking the way I like to think of it is we can take what's going on in our head and our heart and our body and and put it out on a stage. The stage can be just any space in a room. Mm -hmm. And after the warm up where everybody's connected and feeling safe, you know, a theme emerges, a person Mm -hmm. whose piece we're going to do emerges, that person's called the protagonist. The director will then guide the person in exploring through action what it is they would like to have be different in their life. Mm -hmm. And then through the action, the protagonist chooses people to play different roles. So it could be an interpersonal role, like Mm -hmm. they could choose somebody to play their mother, their husband, their father, their sister, their cousin, their sponsor, whoever. But they can also explore interpsychic roles. So Mm -hmm. my fear, my anger, my sadness, Mm -hmm. if you're working with people in recovery, my disease, Mm -hmm. my higher power. Mm -hmm. I've had really interesting and amazing people show up in psychodramas over the years because you can invite in fictional characters, you can invite in deities. I mean, I've had everybody from Gandhi to John Lennon to a snuffleupagus show up in my (laughs) office. (laughs) Snuffleupagus. And it really taps into the belief that we are all Mm co-creating our experience. It taps into the belief that we are all the therapists of each other. When Mm -hmm. Moreno started the psych hospital in 1936 in New York, this was long before medication for psychosis existed. He was the only doctor in the place but he called everybody in the facility, including the patients, doctor. Mm -hmm. He believed we are each other's Mm -hmm. healers. And he entered into their world. So if he met a psychotic patient and he introduced himself, good morning, I'm Dr. Moreno, who are you? If the patient's response was, well, my name is Jesus, Mm -hmm. 
he didn't contradict the person right. and say, well, you know, according to your chart, it says your name is John Smith. Mm -hmm. He walked right up to the person and shook his hand and said, oh, Jesus, I've always wanted to meet you. Tell me about your life. Mm. And so the whole concept behind it is that if I'm directing a piece of your work, I'm not guiding you. I'm mm -hmm. following you. Right. Following you because innately you have the answers inside of you. Mm -hmm. And my job is to help you find them. Yes. It's interesting because I've been training in sensory motor psychotherapy and the same premise of the client has all of the answers and information. And for someone who works with folks in addiction and a lot of people who struggle with denial, there was a part of me that like said like, no, that's not true. Like people don't necessarily know, but then someone else pointed out it's the higher self that knows. And I was of like, course. yes, that's how I'm, <laughs> that's how I'm going to yeah. get on board with it. Because and the voice of that higher self has been blocked. Right. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. So in psychodrama, we can bring that higher voice into the room and then we can explore what's between you and that higher voice. What right. is in the way? Exactly. Could be addiction, could be trauma, could mm -hmm. be mental illness. It could be all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Let's explore it through action rather than just talking about it. Another beauty of psychodrama is that we get to practice new behavior. That's a key component of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's what we call role training. So it's not just about having a big catharsis. It's right. not just about having the aha insight, which are both very important. It's about, okay, now that I have that, now what? Integration. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's interesting because we call that role training in psychodrama, we call it a catharsis of integration. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. There's something so magical about group work, period. Amen. And then, you know, when you take it to the next level and tapping into the higher self, the intuition, the subconscious, all of those different things, it's just incredible what can come out. I did a piece of Family Constellation, which is different than a psychodrama, but it is a lot of the same principles of, of you know, moving through things. And it's funny, like I intellectually knew this particular pattern in my family. I don't, I don't want to like out anyone in my family, but I knew intellectually a particular pattern. But when I saw it played out in front of me, I like lost my shit. And I was like, oh, yep. this is why I am the way I am. Right. Yeah. This is the legacy that's yeah. been handed down to me. Yeah. So talk about like head, heart to body. Absolutely. Yeah. It's transformational for people. I'm remembering a million years ago when I worked in New York, I had this parents of substance abusing clients mm. group that I ran every week. And there was a woman in that group who was a widow. Her husband had died of addiction and she had four kids, the mm. oldest of whom was currently abusing substances. And she mm. kept trying to set these boundaries to tell him if he used, he couldn't stay in the house. Mm -hmm. And she kept struggling to hold that boundary. Yeah. One night, she came into group and I did a piece with her where she had different people play her other kids mm. other than this oldest child who was using substances. And when she reversed roles with mm. those kids and heard how yeah, scared yeah. they were and how sad they were, I mean, she, she reversed and spoke from their place. Yeah. And every time she reversed, I would say to her in the role of her daughter or her son, what do you want to say to your mom? consistently, mm -hmm. all three of them said, I don't feel safe with him in the house. Yeah, It clicked for her that night in a way it never had. Mm -hmm. And she went home that night and she told him, you either stay clean or you're going to treatment mm -hmm. or you're living on the street. Mm -hmm. And she stuck to it. He ended up leaving the next day because he didn't stay clean. And uh, he went to treatment a week later. Mm. But it was that psychodrama. She'd been struggling with it for months and months and yeah. months. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. only when she stood in the role of her kids and understood the effect that it was having on them that she said, oh, the decision's made. We're not going to live like yeah. this anymore. I was listening. I think it was Radio Lab, and I cannot remember which episode it was, but they were talking about like a virtual reality situation where Freud was there. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then you got to be yourself telling Freud your problems, and then you got to be Freud talking back. And so basically this, psychodrama. <laughs> yeah, exact same concept. And I was like, oh, shit. Yeah, that's that's exactly what that is. Yeah. I'm curious for you personally, since you said you were doing psychodrama before you even decided to go back to school and become a therapist. What drew you to that? I like to say I got 12 stepped into it ah. because a woman who became a friend of mine, I heard her tell her story about being an adult child of addiction, mm -hmm. and in her case, adult child of suicide. 
And she mentioned this thing called psychodrama. Hmm. And I went up to her after she finished and I said, what is this thing? I've never heard of it. And she said, oh, well, I'm going to this workshop on Saturday. Why don't you come with me? Hmm. And it was the first time I'd ever been in any kind of therapy. Wow. Ever. And I went and I was hooked. Mm-hmm. I was hooked. I called, it was that therapist I mentioned, Dick Graycheck, he ran the workshop and I was hooked and I called him. It was a Saturday workshop. I called him the following Monday and said, I want to come see you individually. Mm -hmm. And I saw him for probably about a year. And then he was starting a psychodrama personal growth group. Mm -hmm. And I joined that. And then the other rest of it you heard eventually I, Mm -hmm. I ended up joining training groups and doing residential training and it's a long road to get certified as a psychodramatist. So I did tons and tons of training and it's a lot. <laughs> and is. I heard that there's a movement to try to shorten it a bit so that it's not quite as intensive, but. Well, I can argue a mm-hmm. lot of reasons why mm-hmm. it shouldn't be shortened. And I can argue right. a lot of reasons why it should. Exactly. Right. There used to be that when Moreno was alive, there were sort of levels of not necessarily certification, but you became to what's called a trained auxiliary first. An auxiliary is somebody who plays roles in other people's pieces. And Mm. it takes a lot of practice and skill to access your own spontaneity. Mm -hmm. And spontaneity is a core piece of psychodrama, which Mm -hmm. I can get back to in a minute. Then you became an assistant director. And then you became a director. Like there were all of these levels below actually getting certified. And so there were milestones that people could reach and that would give them a sense of not only achievement, but validity in mm-hmm. the psychedelic community. And now all we have is you become a certified practitioner, which takes a tremendous amount of work to do. And I mean, you've experienced it firsthand. Mm-hmm. When you look at the depth of where we're taking people, there's a lot of reasons why, you know, it looks easier than it is. There's a yes. awful lot of moving parts. There's yes. so many moving parts. Time and time again, when I have a student who directs in group for the first time, once they're done, they say, oh my God, I had no idea how many things I had to be tracking all right. the time and stay in my own spontaneity. Right. But it looks seamless when the director knows what they're doing. It does. Yeah. That's what I was so impressed. The woman who does it here in Chicago, Brittany Starr is her name. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to have her on the podcast at some point. Ooh. And I was just like, that seemed effortless, but I know that it wasn't. Good right. job there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's like when you watch something like Cirque du Soleil and they're just yeah. so smoothly spinning around and doing, you know, all of these twists, mm-hmm. all this acrobatic stuff. And it's like, yeah, they trained for 12 years to be able to do right. that. Right. Yeah. It's pretty oh. crazy. So can I tell you my experience Please, with the psychodrama? I've been to know. So it's less about the psychodrama and more about like, are you into woo-woo? We didn't talk about this. Are you into woo-woo shit? I'm, I'm three exits past woo-woo. I'm <gasps> like hooky dookie. Oh, great. Then you're going to love this. So my therapist, she has practiced shamanism and and she and I have talked about like my intuitive gifts and kind of honing that and whatever. And so that's kind of like the backdrop to this story. I've also been super into ghosts lately. Don't know why, but in the psychodrama, I don't want to tell the story of the person whose psychodrama it was, but essentially they were talking to a bunch of people who had passed on and they'd set up a cemetery essentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they were going one by one talking to specific people. And as that's happening, I'm nearly against a wall, but I feel a man standing behind me. Mm -hmm. And I kept looking back like it was absolutely like someone was standing right behind me, breathing down my neck. And interesting. And as this person got closer to one specific character, it just became stronger. The feeling was stronger and stronger and stronger. Finally, when she got to that character, I heard not heard. I guess it's more just like a knowing, but inside saying, I am here. I am here. And I was like, Mm. holy shit. Oh, my God. And like I was doubling that person. So I couldn't like do anything about it. I was doubling the protagonist. So I couldn't really do anything about it. But I was just like, he's here. He's here. He's here. And he wants to talk to you. So I couldn't do anything within the drama with it. But in the sharing, you could, though. Yes. And he said there were other things that he said that also tracked with what she was experiencing. And so at the end, she had turned to hug me and I said he was here. And he wants to let you know, good job, keep it up. And she just wept. And I was like, oh. yeah. And she's like, I always felt like he was with me. I'm like, yep. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So you're really stepping into your intuition. <gasps> 
Yeah, I guess. And I like, of course, I go to my therapist and I'm like, okay, Susan, what do we do now? What does this mean? How do I, how do I do it again? She's like, nope, you just go on about your life. I'm like, God damn it. (laughs) Just stay open. (laughs) Yeah. That's amazing. So you used a term that people don't know, Mm -hmm. doubling. Yes. Yes. Thank you. So the protagonist is the main character and the double is essentially their double for lack of a better term. And the way that we did it is, you know, if the protagonist would say something, but the double feels like there's something unsaid, that we would be the one to say it. And then also the double could be if the protagonist is having kind of internal psychic questions like, you know, this part of me wants to do this and this part of me wants to do that. Then the double becomes this part that wants to do that. And you switch roles essentially with yourself. Is that? That's pretty good. Okay, thanks. (laughs) For (laughs) a one timer. Thanks. Not bad. So structurally, the double stands behind the Mm -hmm. protagonist. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the way I like to think of it is that it's the inside voice that often Mm. doesn't get spoken. So a lot of times, and different people direct differently. I was trained so that anybody with permission from the director can get up and double. Mm, Okay. They can step in, we call it hit and run doubling. They can step in Mm. and say something that they have a hypothesis Mm -hmm. that the protagonist might Mm -hmm. be feeling. And then the protagonist gets to correct it or change it or adapt it or embroider upon it if, if right. it's right. But a lot of times when we double, we're helping the protagonist to say what may be deep inside that they're not as in touch with, mm-hmm. or sometimes it can help them to have a concise way of saying something, or if we're practicing new behavior, mm-hmm. it's a way to help them find language. There's lots of different uses for it, but it's one of the most profound pieces of psychodrama that mm-hmm. Moreno created And I mean, I use it all the time. And the beauty of it is, particularly if you're working in a group setting, and especially if it's in a residential setting, the group knows each other better than I'll ever know them. Right. So they get to double each other and help say what's not being said. Mm -hmm. It's an extraordinary tool to use. I've often thought that I wanted to go into business as a personal double walking around (gasps) behind people all day long. Oh my God, can we do it? Yes. That sounds amazing. Saying what they really <laughs> want to say that they're not saying. That sounds like a great movie. I crack up when I think of Key and Peele when they had, ang- uh, what was his name? Oh, Luther- yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Angry Obama or something like it's that. Luther the Angry yeah. something. Yeah. Oh, but it's basically, that's a double. Yeah. Exactly. So it was his anger double so that every time, mm-hmm. and I always get them confused. Peel is the shorter one. So he played president and then yes. Key would stand behind him and speak from an angry place right. as Obama because Obama was so poised. Mm-hmm. I will never forget when President Obama spoke at the correspondence dinner. Yes, and they did it. That was so good. <laughs> And I was like, there's Luther. It's his anger double. Yeah. It was fabulous. But yeah, that's yeah. a double. Yeah. That's a perfect pop culture description. Yep. So I want to ask this question under the umbrella of spiritual midwife. Are you a healer? You know, it's funny. I struggle with that word because mm-hmm. I don't believe people are broken. Mm-hmm. When I think of being a spiritual midwife, I think more from a perspective of holding space for people to step into their own healing. When it comes to spirituality, it's so hard to find language. Yeah. But for them to step back into their authentic selves mm-hmm. that God pushed down, pushed away, taken away, robbed from them, all of those kinds of things. And to create spaces and opportunities for people to connect or reconnect with their authentic selves or with their higher self. So I shy away from that word healer, Mm -hmm. but for lack of a better term, I've had people describe me as that. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what your, your perspective is on that word. It's something I want to reclaim. I think for those of us who are doing the work ourselves, you know what I mean? So I am a wounded healer. There's no doubt about right. that. It's so interesting when you ask the same question over and over. Now I'm, I'm tending to get very similar results. And usually people are like, yeah, I'm totally into wounded healer, but healer, eh. and it tends to be the reasons why not are often because they don't want to be associated with like snake oil kinds of healers, Mm. or there's a spiritual wounding that that word is somehow related to Jesus and they're not vibing that way, or 
kind of like you said, like people aren't broken or also people would rather call themselves a conduit or a vessel. But I have had several yeah. people who are like, yeah, I'm going to take that word. And I think that's what my heart wants is for us to take that word. Mm -hmm. And I'm not quite sure why, but I don't really need to know. <laughs> yeah, no, you don't. Yeah. And I think everybody gets to define themselves in whatever yeah. feels right for them. Right. It's interesting. I just, because I'm sitting on my computer doing this with you, I just pulled up the definition of the word healer. And mm -hmm. I think the first definition is a person who claims to be able to cure a disease or injury oh. using special powers. Yeah, no, that's not what we do. That's not what I do. Right. But the third one is something that alleviates a person's distress or anguish. Yes. And I hold space for that right. and I provide opportunities and tools and compassion and love and doubling Yeah, to help people do that. And like I said, I don't believe that people are broken. Mm -hmm. I know they may feel broken inside. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like in the 12 steps when I hear the language of character defects. Character def I, I them, hate it. I call them character defenses. Yeah. That's what I've called them for yeah. a long time because I don't believe we're defective. Right. I believe we've got defenses in place because we needed to have them. Right. And I learned a long time ago, actually from one of my professors in graduate school, he said, your job is not to take away people's defenses. It's to provide an environment that's safe enough that they're willing to let them down. Yeah, I really wish that there could be a rewrite of all of the 12-step literature that would take shame resilience into account because yeah. character defects would be number one on the list. <laughs> well, if you know the history, Bill Wilson was just looking for another word that was not shortcomings. So right. a lot of times he was just trying to mix up mm -hmm. the language. Yeah. But it feels a little too religious to me. Yeah. And I just, I don't believe we're defective. I don't. Yeah, I've really aligned with at least mentally, I'm still trying to get there emotionally, but mentally aligned with more of the Buddhist ideal that we mm -hmm. have a diamond inside of us that needs to be uncovered. And that's really yeah. what we're shooting for. I have a question kind of dovetailing off of this. I really want to do a research study and I'm like talking about it to try to like, I think crystallize where I want to go with it. But there's something about awakening and folks who are more readily available for that and folks who kind of struggle to do that, yeah. you know, and especially in addiction, we see a ton of that, like people get better and thrive and just become like, I have one client who I always say is sunshine in human form. And mm -hmm. under his addiction, he was certainly not that. So I feel like I see like three different types of clients. I'll see a client who really is taken by recovery and, and really throws themselves into healing and awakening and they become this like gorgeous, shiny version of themselves. And then I see folks who get into recovery and stay with the addiction recovery part and don't go the next level to do the real like soul searching and awakening and emotional sobriety work. Right. And then I see folks who, for whatever reason, struggle to even get the sobriety part and then can't awaken then further from that. I know it has to do with ego strength and I know it has to do with resilience, but there's a spiritual thing too, I think, that- yeah separates that. And I'm curious, since you've been in the field longer than I have, can you put a finger on that? Small question, I know. <laughs> Small question. Yeah. I just have to solve addiction in the next five minutes. Right. Um, go. I come back to a core principle of psychodrama and people don't know this. Most people don't know this, but psychodrama actually started as a religion. What? Yeah. Moreno was in yeshiva. Oh, that's and, crazy. Yeah. And he and his classmate, Chaim Kelmer, came up with this religion of the encounter. And their whole concept was that if we have the capacity to reverse roles with other people, then mm -hmm. there's no need for conflict. If we can understand the world from other people's perspectives, we can agree to disagree. Right. But we don't have to kill each other. Uh, yeah. You know? And I would definitely sign up for that religion. <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, wow. But one of the core principles, you know, I mentioned how it was such a disaster. The night he did this in 1921. One of the core principles we believe in is warm up. Mm -hmm. And the language of psychodrama is so non judgmental. I mm -hmm. think the term resistance in our culture has taken on such a negative connotation. And in psychodrama, we do not believe that somebody is resistant, we believe mm -hmm. that they are inadequately warmed up. 
Hmm. And it sounds semantic, but it's not. It's not. It's not. <laughs> so if somebody yeah. comes into treatment and they have had a surprise mm-hmm. party intervention, right? And they do yeah. not want to be there, and they're in pre-contemplation mm-hmm. mode. It's everybody else's fault. I don't have a problem. There's not a whole heck of a lot that we as clinicians can do to change them. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that model of the stages of change, pre-contemplation, contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, et cetera, the first phase in that is just having people come back the next time. And that's the warm-up, is giving permission for people to be where they are and not trying to make them be somewhere other than when they are and where they are and who they are. So one of the things I love about the typical warm-up exercises we do in psychodrama is we might do a continuum called a spectrogram. Yes, we did that. And there's continuums with polar opposites. And one end mm-hmm. might represent I'm willing to do anything to heal from my addiction or whatever the language is. And mm-hmm. all the way down to the other end, I'm not willing to do anything at all, mm-hmm. right? And invite people to go stand on that spot. Mm-hmm. Now, in a lot of traditional environments, the counselor or therapist is gonna look at those people down at the end of I'm not willing to do anything, and they're determined to move them down right, that continuum. Right. That's yeah. not my job. Right. My right. job is to say, okay, would you like to share why? They share, you know, I hate this, my family, blah, 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 mm-hmm. you know, screw them all. And I, Oh, okay. Thanks for sharing. Who's next? Mm -hmm, Right. right. I'm just going to give them permission to be where they are. Mm -hmm. One of the first things I learned in graduate school, start where the client is. Social work. (laughs) We have lost that principle. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at people's willingness and capacity for spiritual growth, I think a lot of times, first of all, we think there's more capacity than there is currently. Yeah. And try to force capacity on people. And when I use the term capacity, I'm talking about it from more of a neurobiological standpoint, right? So let me kind of take a step back because I'm also trained in SE, in somatic experience. Got one more class and then I'm done. Oh, yeah. When I talk about capacity, we're looking at that window of tolerance. Right. And for people who come into treatment, who regardless of which one of those three they're going to end up being the bright, shiny, the people who are going to do the bare minimum and then the people who aren't interested at all, Mm -hmm. uh, not bare minimum. Those people work hard to get and stay sober, but they don't then do the deep dive. And if that's where they want to live, I have respect for that. Although I have seen that most people usually hit a wall at about five or 10 years because they need to do the family of origin work. That's exactly what I'm seeing. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. But in that coming in spiritual place, when I talk about the capacity, they may have a very small window of willingness. Yeah. And our job in building that capacity is to help them see that small, mm-hmm. teeny tiny essence of willingness, mm-hmm. celebrate it, and then slowly build on it so that right. that window of tolerance, that capacity to tolerate discomfort, which is at the core of recovery, It's all about tolerating discomfort. Yes. So if I can help them by helping them acquire tools that will help them, even if that tolerating uncomfortability lasts for 30 seconds more than it Mm -hmm. did yesterday, Mm -hmm. that's the capacity that we need to build. And the scary part, you know, when I first started working in this industry, we didn't have an opiate epidemic. Mm -hmm. If people went out and drank again, the chances of coming back were pretty good. Right. 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 They went and used cocaine. Their Mm -hmm. chances, Mm -hmm. for the most part, not all the time, obviously, people get into horrible car accidents and there's suicides. And I mean, it's devastating. And right now between the opiate and the fentanyl, I mean, it's, well, fentanyl, whatever. But between that class of drugs, there's a lot of times people just don't come back. And so I am not a fan of pushing people down that continuum of willingness and capacity. And I'm not a fan of pushing them. I'm a fan Mm -hmm. of inviting them. I think about being a little further ahead on the path with them with a flashlight saying, come on, let's go in this direction. I know it's really dark, but I'm going to shine the light over here and I'm just going to stand here and wait. And when you're ready, you come on over. And if you're Mm -hmm. not, I'm still going to love you. Yeah. It's interesting when I think about my journey in the field and it's been 10 years now since I 
graduated. And earlier on in my career, I think I had this urgency of saving lives, right? Yes, because literally course. people are dying. So there was that urgency. And then like, truthfully, there was also, I think, an ego quality of I can save you, you know, and then right. what that says about me as a therapist. And when I look back now, I much more readily can hold that space of, okay, you're not ready. And that's fine. And I'll be here. And I, I've actually found I am able to move people on the continuum more often when I just right. have that, <laughs> that open, exactly. open when I awareness. just hold the space yeah. Yeah. because I am not their higher power. Right. And I can't, he that again, it's that word heal. Right. I can't fix anybody. I can't heal anybody. Right. Because at their core, they're not broken. And I learned a long time ago, and I've experienced it in my own family, unfortunately. Some people don't want to. There's no interest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I lost both my parents to this disease with mm. lots of letters behind my name. Right. It didn't matter. I mean, I tried this, I tried that, you know, and mm -hmm. I just. It's like I've often said, particularly to family members, as painful as it is, you cannot deny somebody else the dignity of their own process. Right. It's theirs. Yep. And since I've started my own 12 step program, it's so funny. I resisted Aladon for so long because I was like, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> And a woman that I, I see for supervision and consultation was like, okay, it's time. You need to do this. And it's changed my clinical work so much because I'm, I'm getting it on both ends, you know, from the clinical perspective and from the personal perspective that I cannot control anyone but myself. And sometimes not even then. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I supervise people and I actually taught at UCLA in their addiction studies program mm. for about six years, I taught the family counseling class there mm -hmm. until I moved further south and it was too much of a commute. But I would tell the students in the first class, probably a good idea for you to be going to Al-Anon meetings on a regular mm -hmm. basis if you're going to mm -hmm. be working in this field, especially yeah. if you're going to be working with families. Right. Because your own stuff's going to come up. I guarantee yeah. it. Yeah. And so many people say... You know, I, I don't come from addiction. It's like, yeah, let's dive into that a little mm -hmm. bit more because mm -hmm. a lot of times people think that there's no addiction in their family system. Mm -hmm. But if you look at workaholism and you yes. look at spending and eating you look disorders, at codependency right. and eating disorders, mm -hmm. and there's a lot more of it there than you think. Right. <laughs> let's do a genogram class. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And two, I found because my parents were not substance abusers, but my mom's dad definitely was. And I'm sort of halfway convinced that my, my dad's dad was, too, and how that affected my mom being an ACOA and mm -hmm. then the codependency and the control and the victim right. martyr stuff that kind of went down the line. When I went to my first meeting, I was like, oh, oh, you think that, too? Oh, OK. Yeah, <laughs> this is where I belong. <laughs> Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it, I mean, and when I talk to other ACOAs, there's just, there's a knowing mm -hmm. that we have from our experience. And of course, in my experience early on in this process, it was like, I didn't think anybody else felt the same way I did. I didn't think mm -hmm. anybody else thought the same way I did. I didn't, you know, I was so caught up in shame and so yeah. alone. And then when I started listening and talking to other people, it was like, oh, what do you know? I'm not alone in this and neither are you. And again, right. I think about so much of what happens at 12-step meetings when somebody shares their story, they're doubling you. Yeah, exactly. They are saying what you're feeling inside and what you're thinking inside. You're a very good teacher. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I just, you're so good at like bringing it back to the point. I, I like meander and I'm like all over the place and like, I think that made sense, but you're like, you're always bringing it, tying it right back in. You're good, Jean. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> trying to sometimes believe me sometimes I go yeah. off on my own little tangents yeah well this has been great and we have a little bit of time left so I guess last question is is there anything that we didn't talk about that you want to share with people do you have any events how can people contact you any or all of the above well thanks for asking I would say that if you are interested in doing any kind of psychodrama work that you are best finding somebody who is well-trained in it. And it's really okay to ask a lot of questions. If you want to know who's certified in the modality, there is a wonderful website that the American Board of Examiners in Psychodrama, Sociometry, and Group Psychotherapy has. That's a mouthful. <laughs> it is a mouthful. It is psychodramacertification.org. 
That's easy. It's their website, mm-hmm. and you can look for a trainer or you can look for a therapist on that website. Everybody listed on that site is certified. That way, if you want to do training, if you're a therapist, you know who to go work with. Because Mm -hmm. one of my great pet peeves is there's a lot of people out there saying what they're doing is psychodrama, and it's not. Yeah. If there is not three parts to it, warm up, action, and sharing, then it's Mm -hmm. not psychodrama. And Mm -hmm. I have tremendous respect for my colleagues in the experiential therapy world, but it's a different modality. Yeah. I have tremendous respect for my colleagues in the internal family systems world and Mm -hmm. in the, in the constellations world, different modalities, Mm -hmm. gestalt, different modalities, Mm -hmm. right? Although Fritz Perls trained with Moreno and then went Mm -hmm. on to create gestalt, which is an amazing method, Mm -hmm. but it's different. And so I am a bit of a purist when it comes to that (laughs) and You know, the same way I've done training in hypnotherapy, but I would no more start hypnotizing people or claiming to be a hypnotist. I haven't done all the training. I haven't passed the tests. Mm -hmm. I have no right Mm -hmm. to be calling myself that. For those people who are interested in getting certified in experiential therapy, there's, they just changed the name. It used to be the American Society of Experiential Therapists. And Mark Pimsler has just started this international, I'll look it up while we're on the phone All right. in case people are interested in that because yeah. they, have a, they have a website and you can find trainers in that as well. Great. And the other thing is there is a wonderful conference once a year, a national conference on psychodrama. It's coming up pretty quickly. It's coming it's to Chicago next year, I believe. It is, I think. <gasps> Will you be here? Probably not. No. My mission has been to carry psychodrama to communities that are not mm. usually getting it. That's rad. Yeah. I've been part of that organization, the American Society of Group Psychotherapy and Psychodrama for a very long time. And I have just found that I am drawn to be doing more presenting at conferences mm-hmm. with uh, exposing people who don't have exposure mm-hmm. to psychodrama or sociometry. And sociometry is a whole thing we didn't even talk a lot about. Mm-hmm. But wonderful way to not only warm up a group, it's a way to suss out transferences. It's a way to build Mm. connection and safety. It's a way to, the way I like to think of it, it's like crocheting this net of safety for a group to Mm. be able to step into work. Mm. And you don't have to be doing psychodrama to do sociometry. I use sociometry in all kinds of settings. I've done lots of team buildings over the years and business settings and in it's such a powerful modality and it's one Hmm. part of psychodrama. So anyway. So yeah, all that stuff. (laughs) All that stuff. And the only other thing I would say is I do offer ongoing psychodrama training, mostly in California at this point, Mm -hmm. pretty much up and down the coast of Southern California. And I am doing leadership workshops for both men co-leading those and with women Mm. and really digging that. And I love teaching and a lot of places have reached out to me to come to them and do training with their staff. And it's a lot of fun too. Yeah. And the other thing about psychodrama is it's not all like on the floor in a fetal position with snot pouring down your face. A lot Mm -hmm. of times People think, oh my God, I don't want to do that. I mean, I've got a TED Talk on my website, which is theactioninstitute.com. And I did a TEDx talk, God, quite a few years ago now, where we basically did a psychodrama demonstration. (gasps) Cool. Yeah. So the society is the International Society for Experiential Professionals. Mm. That's the other one. And that you can get certified as an experiential therapist for far less training than mm-hmm. what it takes to be a psychodramatist. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if anybody's interested in checking that out, there's a therapist out there or a counselor. Very cool. I hope I covered everything you asked me. Yeah. I mean, I really believe that whatever is supposed to come out is what comes out. So, but I... I've enjoyed the hell out of this conversation. I hope you have. Me too. Me too. Thank yeah, you so much. Absolutely. A little shout out to our friend, Beck G. Cohen. Who yeah. Went, what, what? What, what? <laughs> Love me some Beck G. Cohen. Yeah, for sure. I'll have to make sure like, okay, you have to listen to Gene's interview and he'll have to listen to the whole thing before he gets to that point. <laughs> I'll be like, wait, when are they going to talk about me? Not till the yeah, end, We're Beck. talking about you, Beck. <laughs> about how much we both dig you oh yes well thank you so much for being here today this is great Thank you so, so, so much, Jean, for being my guest today. And for those of you listening, I hope you really enjoyed this episode. For more information on Jean, you can go to our website at www.headhearttherapy.com slash podcast. 
As always, thank you to the Creative Imposter Studios for editing, to Liam O'Donnell for the album art, and to Ben Mueller for our theme music. Until next time, bye-bye.